Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, we're here to talk a little bit about what I think was quite an important vote on the floor of the House of Commons yesterday. Important in a couple of respects. Important substantively because the last number of times that we've seen Prime Ministers prorogue Parliament, which means that all of the work of the House of Commons stops and MPs aren't able to meet on the floor of the House of Commons, it's been an abuse of power. We saw that in the summer of 2020 when Justin Trudeau prorogued Parliament to get out of the We Charity scandal. We saw it with Stephen Harper to escape accountability in respect of Afghan detainees and also to avoid in 2008 a non-confidence vote that he knew he was going to lose. All of these are instances of Prime Ministers abusing that gatekeeping power over Parliament and the vote yesterday was on a motion that I crafted to make it harder for Prime Ministers to be able to abuse that power of prorogation and to assert a much stronger role for the House of Commons in questions of confidence and prorogation. And one of the things that I found both odd and quite frustrating about the vote yesterday was to see Pierre Polyev stand shoulder to shoulder with Justin Trudeau to maintain his gatekeeping power over Parliament. I think that says a lot about who Pierre Polyev is and the sincerity with which he's talking about busting up gatekeeping powers. I think what the vote yesterday shows is that Pierre Polyev isn't interested in taking on gatekeeping. He's interested in, com in becoming Canada's foremost gatekeeper. That's an important difference for Canadians to keep in mind, but it's also part of a theme when you look at the work of Pierre Polyev. I mean, this is a guy who says, He's going to tackle the housing crisis. Actually, he doesn't have a lot of good ideas when it comes to solutions. Big on the critique and poor on solutions. What do I mean by that? Well, he himself likes to say that he was housing minister under Stephen Harper. Under Stephen Harper, Canada lost 800,000 affordable and social housing units because that government refused to carry on the operating grants that made those low rents possible and it's one of the reasons why we're seeing a spike in homelessness in Canada today and it's why we're so far behind other G7 countries in terms of how much social housing stock we have. We hear a guy who says he's going to stand up for uh, Canadians and that he's concerned about their household budget, that he wants to manage public finance as well but in fact the best way to lower prescription drug costs for Canadians and have Canada spend less money uh, on prescription drugs than we do today is to have a single-payer public universal pharmacare program. Pierre Polyev doesn't support that, much like it seems many Liberals who have been resisting NDP calls for a single-payer pharmacare program. So on housing, we see Liberals and Conservatives committed to market-based solutions only. They're not doing enough, not even talking enough about the need for social and affordable housing. When it comes to prescription drugs, we see Liberals and Conservatives working uh, together to frustrate attempts towards a single-payer pharmacare system. And when we look at the vote yesterday around a basic question about how much power the Prime Minister has over Parliament, once again we see Liberals and Conservatives working together to maintain the potential for Prime Ministers to abuse that power and um, put the House of Commons under their thumb. And I think it's especially cute coming from Pierre Polyev, who recently just did a video where he's chomping down on an apple and talking about how he will cut rules out of the way that get, it, that get in the way of building housing and get in the way of doing this and get in the way of doing that. And because, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't think that we need any more time to contemplate solutions. We just have to get doing them. Yesterday, we had a solution on the table to stop prime ministers from abusing their power to uh, over the House of Commons and all of a sudden he wants to call in the academics. He wants to study it for years. He's not too sure that we can move so quickly. Give me a break. This is a guy whose whole brand is based on changing rules if they don't work but his actions tell a very different story. And the story they tell is that Pierre Polyev is one of the biggest defenders of the status quo in Canada today despite what he says because when push comes to shove what he's shown is that he wants to continue on the same market-based track that led us to the housing crisis. He wants to continue on the same path that has led to some of the highest drug prices in Canada. And he wants to continue on a path that allows prime ministers to abuse their power <clears throat> and, and push the House of Commons out of the way when it's not serving their interests. That's what I think is very interesting about the vote 
uh, that took place on the floor of the House of Commons yesterday, and I think Canadians should take note. Thank you. Forgive me, Mr. Daniel. I haven't been following the motion too quick, too too closely. Can you just remind us what were you trying to do with it? I understand that you want to prevent the gatekeeping powers of, of, of the Prime Minister's office to probe Parliament, but like, what were you trying to do? With sure. The so the, the motion does two things. One is it kind of clarifies our confidence convention. So you'll know. Whenever questions of confidence come up, usually we got to call in the constitutional experts and ask, you know, well, is this really a confidence matter or is it not? I think it's ridiculous in a 21st century democracy to have that much uncertainty about something that's so core to the formation of a government and whether or not we have an election, right? And so the idea was to, was to clear up what is actually an issue of confidence on the floor of the House of Commons, speech from the throne, budget, uh, estimates, right? Those are already pretty well considered to be those things. And then have a process for deciding what else would be an issue of confidence. And to give the House of Commons a much bigger role than historically it's had, because usually it's just been up to the Prime Minister to say whether the House has confidence in the Prime Minister or not, which seems backwards. It seems to me that the House of Commons should be the one to decide whether they have confidence in the Prime Minister or not. So there was a piece around the confidence convention and codifying it better. And then the other piece of that was to say, okay, now that we know what is a matter of confidence and what isn't, and we have a mechanism for clear confidence votes, now when the Prime Minister wants to pr prorogue Parliament, he can either call for a confidence vote just before the prorogation. If he doesn't, then the first matter of business upon our return would be a confidence vote. So I think that's really important if you look at the 2008 example where Stephen Harper knew that there was a confidence vote coming. He prorogued the House. He left it uh, prorogued for several weeks. Upon return, then he was able to schedule opposition day uh, motions, because that's actually a prerogative of the government in the House, further down the line. So right now, the Prime Minister has a way of avoiding confidence votes for months, if that's what uh, he or she wants to do. So the point of the motion was to say, you can't pull the court on the House of Commons, and then come back like nothing happened. You can either test confidence before you have a prorogation, or you know that when you come back, that's the first time of, of, of business. It's not a hard stop on the Prime Minister's powers, but the advice I got both from lawyers here on Parliament Hill and off is that if you actually wanted to put that power properly in the hands of the House of Commons, where I think it should be, you would need a constitutional amendment. So I worked with the House of Commons to provide as much of a role for the House of Commons and as much political accountability for the Prime Minister as is possible without changing the Constitution. Do you fear that, I mean, some people would find it odd that the NDP was trying to work so closely with the Conservatives on an issue like this? Well, look, I mean, I've worked with Liberals on issues, obviously. I've worked with Conservatives on issues. I'm here to get things done that I ran on and that I think are important. And when you're talking about one of the core tenets of our democracy, there's really not much else that is more important. And we see that in cases where prime ministers choose to abuse those powers. So I'm happy to work with whoever. I thought a natural partner in this would have been the Conservatives, given everything that Pierre Polyev has to say about how Justin Trudeau has too much power and the House of Commons' job is to hold him to account. I thought this was a pretty obvious case of the House of Commons taking more authority for itself and creating tools to hold prime ministers to account. And what we found out is that Pierre Polyev actually isn't that interested in it, because I don't think he's really interested in holding the institution to account. I think he's interested in getting in there so that he can run amok. And I think yesterday's vote was an example of how this man is not to be trusted. He says that he wants to take on gatekeepers. I don't buy it. I think he wants to become a gatekeeper. And that's a very different story. If he were interested in tackling gatekeeping and that problem, and if he were sincere in all his sanctimonious platitudes about Parliament and the role of the House of Commons. He had an opportunity yesterday to strengthen the position of the House of Commons over the Prime Minister, and he passed it up because he wants those powers for himself if uh, Canadians make the mistake of putting him in the Prime Minister's office. Um, can we look ahead to the fall economic statement? Is that something that your, your, your caucus has started to discuss? about maybe what you'd like to see? And have you put any asks or requests on the table to the finance minister? 
Well, we're certainly very interested in what will ultimately be in the fall economic statement, and we do have discussions both about what we'd like to see in the fall economic statement, but more generally about what we want to see government do in order to have the backs of Canadians at this in this moment of real challenge. So I would say one of our highest priorities is to see some serious action on the housing file. I've stood on this stage with, with Jenny Kwan before to talk about uh, the fact that we think, you know, what the matter with C56 and the, and the GST rebate on purpose-built rental is, is that it's announced as a market measure without any plank for social or affordable housing. So we insist that the government bring forward something to show a meaningful commitment not just commitment, but to actually make funds available to organizations that are prepared to build affordable and social housing across the country. That's the missing piece, and we need to see that. We are certainly pressing to see real action on housing in the fall economic statement. We know that um, Canadians across the country, and I was just hearing about this as part of our pre-budget consultation travel in the Finance Committee, and Canadians are looking for a national uh, school nutrition program. That's something that is really important in terms of educational outcomes. We know that when children are fed, they do better in school. We know that more families than ever in Canada are struggling to put food on the table. So we see this both as a way to increase the, the bang for education dollar by making sure that kids have a full stomach and can pay attention in class, but we also see it as something that will help address the affordability challenge. Because for, for Canadian families that are struggling to put food on their table, knowing that they can send their kid to school and they can get a good meal at school, as well as learn uh, how to read and do their math and, and how to think critically as well, um, that that can be a real help to uh, Canadians in a very difficult time. So uh, those are just some of the things that are on our mind and that we think uh, government should be moving on as quickly as possible. There are, of course, others, including on the revenue side. And, you know, one of the things that we've been saying for a while, and I think this is another point of contrast with, with Mr. Polyev. I mean, he's, he likes to talk about the carbon tax and what that does for the price of gas at the pumps. But the fact of the matter is, is that oil and gas profits and the increase at the pump in order to pay those profits has done a lot more to hurt Canadians in the pocketbook than the carbon tax. And New Democrats now have been calling for a long time for an excess profit tax on the oil and gas industry that has seen, you know, uh, just record, record increases in, in profit. So this isn't revenue increases. This is after their costs, their take home is bigger than it's ever been. And we think that it makes a lot of sense, just as we force the Liberals to do with banks and insurance companies, to say that oil and gas companies have to take some of that excess profit and that that get invested back in making things available to Canadians that they need, like lower cost prescription drugs, child care, a school nutrition program, and investment in housing. So, you know, I think it's kind of rich for Pierre Polyev to spend so much time focusing on the federal carbon tax, which incidentally, I mean, I've watched MPs from his caucus get up and decry the federal carbon tax. They're from jurisdictions that have provincial carbon taxes. You could cut the whole federal carbon tax. Those MPs, uh, constituents aren't going to see a break because they pay a provincial carbon tax. So there's been a lot of emphasis put on that by the Conservatives. It's got nothing to do with actually helping people with their pocketbook expenses, because in some cases, it's not even a tax that applies in their jurisdiction. And not a word about the excess profits of oil and gas companies. And I think that says a lot, again, about who Mr. Polyev is and the kind of gatekeeping that he endorses, which is gatekeeping on behalf of oil and gas companies. You'd be upset about the carbon tax, but he doesn't care a whit that they're using their oligopoly to milk Canadians for billions and billions of dollars every year. At that point, we saw the PBO report this morning that uh, a tax such as what you've called for would generate $4 billion if you apply over two years, I think 2020, 2021, on excess profits over a billion dollars. Can we get your reaction to that? Also, do you have any fear that that might be passed on to the consumer if there's another tax? On well, so first of all, I think what it shows is that um, there are ways to raise revenue. As I say, oil and gas companies are experiencing record profits, and even after 
the excess profit tax that the that the PBO has costed, they will be making record profit. So nobody's talking here about taking all their profits away, but $2 billion a year for two years is a significant amount of money and does provide for a fair amount of investment, whether that's in the housing space or elsewhere that we need. So that's something that we do support. We do think the government has to be looking at revenue ideas and they have to be looking at some of the big corporations that are making outsized profits to get it because Canadians aren't in a position to pay more themselves. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, and the second part of your question was? You know, there's a fear that they could pass it along, right? I mean, that would be something that I think people would be afraid of, that we're imposing another tax on big oil. They might pass on this tax to, to the consumer at the pump. Yeah, so two things I would say about that. One general and then one specific. So when we talk about taxes on companies that are making outsized profits, that concern is always raised. I think it's a real concern. It's one that I respect. However, I would say that's why New Democrats, when we talk about public policy, really focus on how do we bring down the cost of things that people can't do without. And, and I think we have a better approach than the Conservatives who say, cut, just cut taxes. Because the other side of that is that, yes, when you add a tax, that gets passed on to the consumer. But what we've seen in today's economy especially is that when you cut taxes on Canadians, oil and gas companies, big box stores, banks raise their fees in order to eat up that extra disposable income. So that's why I believe that broad-based tax cuts actually don't do the job because the market will raise its prices to capture that extra income. When it comes to oil and gas specifically, I would point you to my colleague Brian Massey from Windsor West, who's done a lot of great work over the years talking about having a body, as they do to some extent in Atlanta, Canada, to regulate the price of oil and gas. We have in Manitoba, we have a Manitoba Public U Utilities Board. If, uh, auto insure, if the auto insurer in the province wants to raise their premiums, they have to go through an application process with the PUB. If the hydro utility wants to raise its rates, they have to go through an application process. That's to protect the consumer and make sure that companies selling products that Manitobans don't have a choice to buy or not are charging fair prices and that Manitobans aren't getting gouged. We could do something like that at the national level. It's a good way to make sure that you can have reasonable levels of taxation on sectors that sell things Canadians can't choose not to buy while ensuring that you have fair uh, prices and that those costs aren't just automatically passed on to consumers. So there's a couple ways to do that. I would say mostly let's focus on bringing down the cost of things people can't do without. And part of that is to have a regulatory framework around oil and gas in Canada that currently is lacking, but that we have models for for other key industries across the country. Uh, we'll just take a break from the room questions and go online. Uh, we do have a question from Rachel Aiello from CTV. Please go ahead, Rachel. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for doing this. Um, just to get back to your motion, I'm curious, uh, in the conversations you had with colleagues, did any of the Liberals or Conservatives like explain to you why they were going to be voting against this? Well, I mean, what I have from the House debate is, you know, really an appeal for more for more study. I think we've had, you know, if you go back to to 2008 when when the when the kind of obvious abuse of prorogation began in earnest, I think I think we've learned a lot about it, and I think we had a good proposal on the table. And I do find it passing strange that Mr. Polyev, who usually is very dismissive of the idea of study, very dismissive of the idea of uh, consulting experts, suddenly uh, wants to spend a long time doing expert consultation before solving something that is very obvious, I think from a common sense point of view, is a problem. So going forward now that these protections have been passed over, what do you think this means uh, for future parliaments, what should Canadians expect when it comes to the amount of power a prime minister has? Well, what it means is that it hasn't changed. And I think, unfortunately, what Mr. Polyev did yesterday was an invitation to Justin Trudeau to abuse prorogation again. Um, you know, we know that whether it's the Arrive Can app or, and, and the apparent criminal investigation that was not disclosed to the Auditor General or a number of other scandals that this government seems to can't, can't help itself but get into, uh, Mr. Polyev has said that Conservatives support the Prime Minister having the power without any further accountability to just adjourn 
the House of Commons when it doesn't suit his purpose. So I think that was a bad message to send to this Prime Minister. And I think it's a bad message to send to future Prime Ministers that Liberals and, and Conservatives support the idea that, that Prime Ministers can continue to use this power with impunity to protect their political interests over the interests of the country. Uh, any more questions, Rachel? We have a couple more minutes. Nope, that covers it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, back to the room. I have two quick questions. Sarah Jam, you saw what the Ontario legislature did. You saw what the Ontario NDP did. Uh, any comments about what, what happened there? Well, that's an issue, obviously, that's been playing out in Ontario and the Ontario NDP. I'm a Manitoba N MP, so I don't have a comment on that. No concerns about how that was handled? I mean, her, her, her views on Israel and the Palestinian conflict aren't that different from your views, your party's views. I appreciate there's a lot of difficult issues at play in what happened in, in, in Ontario and the, on, and the Ontario NDP, but I'm going to leave it to people who are involved in those organizations to comment. Pharmacare, did you need to see anything in the full economic statement on that, or no? I mean, ultimately, we need a commitment from the Liberals on single payer. Whether that appears in the fall economic statement or somewhere else, I don't think is of particular concern to us. What is, a, it, what is of concern is that the Liberals endorse the idea that the framework we're going to set up will be a single payer framework. That's important for, uh, for an economic reason, which is that it's the single payer system that realizes the savings in the program. If we don't have single payer, what that means is we're going to pay relatively more to cover people that don't currently have a plan and get less coverage for it. And so when we talk about all the studies that have been done, whether it's the Hoskins report, the work of the, par par the, the parliamentary budget officer, and many studies over the decades before that, all of them say that a national pharmacare program will save significant amounts of money. All of them are based on the single payer principle. To deny the single payer principle isn't just about, and it, it isn't some ideological thing, it's a financial thing. Single payer means a more efficient program that saves Canadians money. An umbrella system is the most administratively complex and expensive way to deliver drug coverage to, to Canadians. It's, it's the system that we have now that has led to some of the highest drug prices in the world. It's just adding another component to it. And Canadians are going to ultimately pay more for prescription drugs under a piecemeal program than they will under a single-payer program. It's why New Democrats are so resolved to have the single-payer principle. That's how we save the money. Have you seen new draft legislation, anything like that? Um, I haven't. I understand that our critic, Don uh, Davies, is certainly very engaged with government on this issue um, and I look forward to the next update. Okay, that's it. Uh, we'll conclude the press conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. I know